You know it's a slow news week when Rachel Dolezal is a lead story, but slow doesn't mean boring. In fact, slow is fast, up is down, and black is white when we enter the world of the little racial activist who could. Deceive an entire city into believing she was black, rising to lead the local NAACP chapter until one simple question busted the whole charade for good. Are you African American? I don't, I don't understand the question. Are your parents, I'm are they white? I... Yes, somehow, combining the complexion of Donald Trump with the haircut of Sideshow Bob fooled everyone for years into believing she was black. And all of this deceptive mastery, and still, somehow, she's only the second fakest black racial justice activist currently. Sorry. I should be kind to Sean. Like Rachel, he has a self-described peculiar racial story. Peculiar in that it is exactly like Rachel's finances. Bankrupt. And that's why Dolezal is back in the news. In a new story by The Guardian, Dolezal describes how she is on the verge of homelessness. Unable to secure a job despite changing her name, offered only opportunity for reality TV or porn. Now, I'd be lying if I said I wouldn't watch it, but we must address the important questions. Does it count as interracial no matter who she's with? Does it count as interracial even if it's solo? I wonder if she'll swallow her pride and accept what opportunity she has. Hey, she already sits on the couch all day anyway. Might as well get paid for it, you know? Anyhow, the significance of this story isn't Rachel's financial or employment troubles. The significance of this story to me is that in her new book, Rachel concedes all the facts of her story. That her parents are white. That she is white in the technical genetic sense. But that she still maintains her black identity. That she still marks black on applications for employment. That yes, she considers herself trans-black, saying, I do think a more complex label would be helpful, but we don't really have that vocabulary. I feel like the idea of being trans-black would be much more accurate than I'm white, because, you know, I'm not white. Where it gets interesting and difficult to navigate logically is Dolezal frames her case by drawing parallels to transgenderism, using much the same reasoning and argumentation. If the narrative of fluid, non-binary gender identity is now widely accepted, Dolezal believes the same should apply to race. It's very similar insofar as this is a category I'm born into, but this is how I really feel. Note that many people reject this claim of hers, specifically people within the transgender community. These critics argue transgender people transition out of medical necessity, a necessity that doesn't exist in Dolezal's case, and that Rachel's racial identity is a choice, unlike gender identity. But if we accept that logic in the case of gender, I personally don't see a clear distinction that separates gender from race in that context. As this Guardian author questions, if we believe someone born without ovaries or a womb can be a woman and accept radical surgery as a legitimate corrective necessity, is it so different for a woman who is born white but feels black to reposition herself on the racial spectrum? And are these critiques actually valid? Is gender identity clearly medically and biologically distinct from racial identity? Is racial identity, in fact, a choice? Dolezal offers rebuttals. On the issue of biology, the Guardian author asks, is racial identity as fluid as gender? Dolezal argues, it's more so because it wasn't even biological to begin with. It was always a social construct. Is she implying that gender has a biological basis? Basically, it's not correct that there is such a thing as biological sex. And I'm a historian of medicine. I can unpack that for you at great length if you want, but in the interest of time, uh, I won't. So that's a very popular misconception. Seriously, though, to Dolezal's point, if we accept that gender is a social construct, why wouldn't we accept that race is a social construct. After all, it's not controversial to argue that race has less biological basis than gender, not more. So if the social construct argument supports transgenderism, 
surely it also supports transracialism, right? If you accept the original premise that gender is a social construct, I don't see the flaw in Dolezal's reasoning. So how about the choice issue? Dolezal says, I feel that I was born with the essential essence of who I am whether it matches my anatomy and complexion or not. I've never questioned being a girl or woman, for example, but whiteness has always felt foreign to me for as long as I can remember. I didn't choose to feel this way or be this way. I just am. What other choice is there than to be exactly who we are? In her book, Dolezal writes that she sees the world through black eyes. Yeah, you know, just like Rihanna with Chris Brown. Being who she is, seeing the world through black eyes, living the dream. But honestly, if you can be transgender on the basis that you feel you have the wrong anatomy, why doesn't it stand to reason that you can be transracial on the basis that you feel you have the wrong complexion? I'm not necessarily arguing for or against either, but I do think viewing one as obviously reasonable and the other as obviously unreasonable is difficult to defend. I fail to see the reasoning there. Now, to be clear, I would rather let biology be king on these issues. Biology determines your sex and your gender. Biology determines determines your phenotype. But my political philosophy is as long as your lifestyle stays within your home and does not impose upon mine, go ahead. The problem is these issues often do not stop at those boundaries. The problem with transgenderism and transracialism, if you accept it, is when that identity becomes politicized, when that identity becomes a tool for political leverage. And we observe that Frequently now. Apparently, we need a federal commission to regulate all U.S. toilets such that no transgender person ever has an uncomfortable pee again. Apparently, we are going to give high school girls testosterone and allow them to beat up the other girls in wrestling tournaments. And because of feelings, this isn't cheating. It's medical necessity. While Dolezal isn't currently advocating for policy change, her reasoning still speaks to using her identity for political leverage. She says there is a black side and a white side on all kinds of issues, whether it's political, social, cultural. There's a perspective, there's a mentality, there's a culture. I'll leave that claim alone for today, though I find the idea that there's a black side and a white side to political debates to be absurdly simplistic. What's noteworthy about that statement is Dolezal's transracialism isn't just about doing whatever she wants within her own home. The statement implies she is positioning herself with political leverage to tell you what to do in yours. And I'm fully aware I'm using some slippery slope reasoning here. I'm worried that transgenderism is going to lead to transracialism, which will lead to transspeciesism until we're all zoophiles living in a transfactual world where nothing makes sense anymore. I get it. I'm not trying to overstate the case. But I do think on the transgender issues currently prominent in our national debate, it is important to think about the logical extent of our reasoning. If you think Caitlyn Jenner is stunning and brave, but Rachel Dolezal is a joke and a fraud, I need to know why. I don't care if we see the world through black eyes or through white eyes. I just care that we see it through reasonable logically consistent ones. Thanks as always for listening and for supporting this channel. Always appreciate that thoughtful discussion down below and especially over on Twitter. That is at ML Christensen. You're always welcome to come hang out and chat in my live streams. Those are linked down in the description. Looking forward to it. Okay, bye.